How would you approach a patient coming in with undifferentiated liver injury? There's such a broad range of conditions that could cause this, and in my opinion, it's absolutely key that you have a solid framework to diagnosing their problem. And in this video, I want to share with you all of my tips and tricks that I like to teach on the wards to medical students and interns, as well as the most common PIMP questions that attendings will ask you on this subject as well. So acute liver failure is defined by altered mental status plus an INR of greater than 1.5. And this is a really important definition to know because it's actually pretty easy to get uh, classified as acute liver failure. Uh, but the main reason this is so important is because this is what is an indication at this point for us to consider liver transplantation. Now, talking about the altered ment mental status, uh, what are different stages of hepatic encephalopathy? This is a very common pimping question that attendings will ask. So stages of hepatic encephalopathy. And you'll actually find out that there are four stages of hepatic encephalopathy. So stage one is going to be uh, just classified as basically a sleep-wake disturbance. And that's why it's so important be to ask patients early on, you know, are you waking up in the middle of the night or are you falling asleep randomly throughout the day? Uh, these can be some of the first signs of uh, hepatic encephalopathy. Stages two through three are defined by varying degrees of a certain physical exam finding, and that is asterixis. And so obviously it's a little bit vague but as it's getting worse, you classify as two versus three. And then stage four is uh, basically the patient is comatose. So make sure you know this because uh, this is very, very commonly pimped uh, from attendings. Now, in regards to a framework to approaching uh, acute liver injury, which is what this patient has at this point, I like to separate it based on the pattern of a liver injury. And so we have what's called a hepatocellular pattern of liver injury. Um, you can have a mixed pattern, and then you can have a cholestatic or obstructive pattern. And the way that this is diagnosed, uh, or the way that you figure this out, is you look at their AST and ALT, and then you look at their ALKFOS, and then their BILI. And so in hepatocellular uh, pattern of liver injury, you're going to see predominantly an elevation in the AST and ALT, with only a slight elevation in the T-bili. And so this is the pattern that this patient fit, uh, fits into. And then for cholestatic, you see a slight elevation uh, in the AST and ALT, and then a more predominant elevation in the alkafos and the bili. Now, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing and it's hard to tell what the, the main abnormality is. And in that case, you can calculate what's called an R factor. And this is very easy to look up on MD calc. And looking at the R factor will help you determine if this is more of a hepatocellular pattern versus cholestatic pattern. And so why is this important? Why does it help to, you know, classify these different patterns of liver injury? And the reason is because uh, the differential is very, very much different depending on the pattern of liver injury that you're seeing. So for hepatocellular, uh, we have things like drug-induced liver injury, which is one of the most common causes. And then you have viral hepatitis, you have autoimmune hepatitis, and then you have ischemic or shock liver. Other causes include alcoholic hepatitis, and then you have various uh, hereditary things such as Wilson's disease, hereditary hemochromatosis, NASH uh, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis is becoming more and more uh, common, and also malignancy, uh, very, very common. So for drug-induced liver injury, uh, the best resource for this uh, to assess if your patient is at risk is using this website called LiverTox. For viral, you know, you think of hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and then you also have things like EBV and CMV. For autoimmune hepatitis, uh, this is going to be kind of in your younger female patients with autoimmune history generally. And so uh, this is associated with what uh, specific marker? And this would be the anti-smooth muscle antibody. Uh, and then for ischemic or shock liver, uh, this uh, includes things like Bud Chiari syndrome. And, uh, you know, typically patient will have history of being super hypotensive or uh, they're in cardiogenic shock or something. Alcoholic hepatitis, remember to look for that AST to ALT ratio of greater than two to one. And then uh, if the patient is uh, receiving treatment, 
you calculate this MADRI discriminative function score, and if it's greater than 32, then the patient may be uh, may benefit from receiving steroids, although the data is kind of wishy-washy at this point. Wilson's disease, typically think of this in a young female, again, uh, with neurologic symptoms, Kaiser Fleischer rings in their eyes. And so the way to check for this is to find a low ceruloplasmin in the serum. And then you also check the 24-hour urine copper. Hemochromatosis, this comes up all the time on boards, but the patient usually has new diabetes. They have bronze or tan skin. They have uh, arthritis and then hypogonadism. And then malignancy, some things that we can check for here are the alpha fetoprotein to look for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And then interestingly, uh, hepatocellular carcinomas is basically the only tumor or uh, cancer that you can diagnose solely with imaging. Like you don't need a tissue diagnosis. And the way that you do that is with a four phase uh, CT or MRI. Now, the one thing I want to point out here is that there's only certain conditions that can cause uh, a, an AST and ALT elevation to the thousands. And it's very important to know these. Um, so drug-induced, viral, and ischemic can all, all cause LFTs in the thousands. And Wilson's disease as well can rarely cause this. But for things like alcoholic hepatitis, if you ever see the AST or ALT greater than 500, it is uh, almost... Uh, ruling it almost rules out alcoholic hepatitis so that's something important to note so if that's the differential for our hepatocellular liver injury what about for cholestatic so uh, the most common one in you know healthy patients and things like that would be gallstone disease or obstruction if you have a, a middle-aged man who has a history of bloody stools what would you think then that would be primary sclerosing cholangitis mainly because of the association with ulcerative colitis. And then also it is associated with ANCA serologies. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, if you have a middle-aged woman who's like itching and all of a sudden jaundiced, then you would think of primary biliary cholangitis, uh, which is associated another, with another antibody that you should definitely be aware of because this is frequently tested, uh, which is the anti-mitochondrial antibody. Don't get this confused with the anti-smooth muscle antibody because they sound very similar, but uh, they are for different diagnoses. Drug-induced liver injury, again, shows up, shows up here. And malignancy, again, also shows up, shows up here, especially like pancreatic malignancies, cholangiocarcinoma, things like that. And then finally, various infiltrative diseases can also cause a cholostatic pattern, mainly because of obstruction again. A couple of final notes that I want to mention is that you'll see the words transaminitis mentioned all the time, but I would try and avoid using terms like transaminitis because it implies that the transaminases are inflamed or uh, in inflammatory, where, which is not true at all. Uh, rather, you should use terms like acute liver injury or hepatitis because the enzymes themselves are not getting inflamed. So transaminitis is really not uh, a good term to use. There's some other topics I'd want to address in a future video as well, such as the MELD score, management of cirrhosis, and things like that. But I'm going to save that for another video, and you'll see that this talk is actually going to be included in my morning report uh, that I gave and kind of give you a sense of how to apply this uh, framework to a real patient. So keep a lookout for that video. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one, and peace.